All right. Hello, 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 hello. I am John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, the father of sin, the transgenic mother of sin. We are hostess of the most us. I've been trying to learn what Bitcoin is. And because I'm interested in computer science, I'm trying to look into these algorithms. And I'm kind of testing to see if I can understand what the algorithm is doing. So I'm testing my knowledge of computer science. So this topic is interesting to me. Also, the, the story of Bitcoin is really interesting. And I'm just starting to learn about it. So don't take me as the official source. But the basic story is that Bitcoin is invented by an anonymous person, Satoshi Nakamoto, who supposedly nobody knows who this is. But whoever this is, or the, this could be a person or a group of people, these are the people who invented blockchain. So you've probably heard the blockchain word. Maybe you don't know what that is yet. And that's kind of what I'm starting to learn now, learn about the code of blockchains. And this anonymous person published what is essentially like an academic paper in white paper form. So white paper is like not peer reviewed, depending on where you're publishing it. So you're just kind of like releasing this topic that you've studied. And so there is this source of where Bitcoin came from that's directly citable that you can read. And the guy who invented it even has an email. So I try to email him or, and we'll, we'll see if he emails me back or whoever it is. So I think a lot of people don't understand even what Bitcoin is because they didn't, they don't even understand the problem that this person is trying to address. So the academic name of this problem called the double spending problem. Okay, the double spending problem is a problem that arose in the bank and financial system when banking started to become digital. So again, like when I first learned about this, I didn't even I didn't even think about this, never even thought about this before. And so I didn't even understand that there was this problem. Okay, so the double spending problem is that when you have bank accounts, you have multiple accounts, right? Okay, so here's account one, here's account two. And imagine this account has $1,000. And this account has $1,000. The question is, imagine account one sends account two $1,000. What should happen in the algorithms, in the coding, is that this account should then lose $1,000 and become zero. And this account should gain $1,000 and become $2,000. Okay. The double spending problem, my understanding of it, is how do you know that account one went down to zero dollars? What would happen or how do you know that account one didn't essentially just digitally add a thousand dollars to the other account and keep their one thousand dollars? How do you know that that didn't happen? You don't necessarily know that that didn't happen because in digital money that is not real. You're not exchanging a physical item. So you don't know if what got put into your account, which is just bits and strings, you don't know if that account actually got deducted. That's the double spending problem. And so what people don't realize is that this has been happening and this causes problems in the accounting structure of the money, which causes money to become inflationary when these errors happen by accident or by crook. Okay, so that's the double spending problem. And that's the first thing you need to understand if you even want to attempt to understand what Bitcoin is, is you have to understand that there is this problem with digital currency, okay? And the way that they had solved this traditionally in the American system was that if we go back to these accounts here, what happens in our system is there is an intermediary, typically a bank, which controls this transaction, and the bank's job is to ensure that the double spending problem doesn't happen. So my understanding is that the way that our system is set up is that this bank is often an intermediary controlling the transfer of money in order to prevent the double spending problem. And when I first heard this, I was a little bit skeptical, but then you think about it and everything that you buy today is either through a card, which connects to your bank account or a check, which has to go through and come from your bank account, or a wire transfer, which has to go through and from your bank account. Nobody today is exchanging cash anymore. And so this problem, or this is not necessarily a problem per se, but it's become much more pronounced in our society that there is this third party 
controlling and transferring sums of money. Okay. So the premise of Bitcoin then, the premise of Bitcoin is how do you solve the double spending problem, but remove a third party from peer to peer transactions? Okay. And because this is a digital problem, the only solution here is in theory going to be algorithmically. So the, the invention of Bitcoin, this is how, this is, this is where the invention of Bitcoin comes in. Is that Bit Bitcoin's innovation, if you summarize it very, very simply, Bitcoin's innovation is to essentially replace the bank with what is essentially a tree of nodes, which forms a consensus, almost like a, a judge. Actually, the better word here would be a jury, a jury that would verify a transaction from one peer to another peer. Okay. So Bitcoin doesn't necessarily remove an intermediary between account one and account two, what it's doing is it's, it's, is it's actually what it's saying is it's saying, if we have to pick an intermediary, we would rather have that sort of a jury of computational peers would judge these transactions. We would trust the consensus of our computational peers more than the system of the banks, which has been fucking our system and inflating our money for a very long time. We would rather trust the consensus. Okay. And the way that the, this voting system is built is the voting system is built by what are called miners. So if you imagine each of these nodes are miners and what miners are is they're people who have set up a computer, a computer system that is dedicated to verifying Bitcoin transactions. So here they're replacing dollars with Bitcoins and these miners set up this voting structure that every time a transaction happens, the miners vote on it. And if a consensus is reached, the transaction is verified. Now, the other in invention that Satoshi Nakamoto threw into this structure, what do I want to say? Maybe we should list the inventions, list the innovations in money here. Because this is a really the correct way to see what crypto cryptocurrency is, is cryptocurrencies are uh, an attempt to innovate and make better the money system that has been thrown upon us that we did not get to choose or pick. So crypto is actually an attempt to make the monetary system a better system. Okay, so if I'm th thinking about the three sort of inventions that were pulled together to form Bitcoin, so the major innovations that Nakamoto adds to the monetary system through the invention of Bitcoin is he adds the consensus jury, which is voting on and verifying transactions. Second thing is he adds a blockchain. So what the blockchain is, is every time the miners make a vote on a transaction and it's validated and verified, as soon as everybody agrees, it gets inscribed in a ledger. So a record of transactions. Okay. And this is what's called a block. So in computer science, what a block actually is, is just an empty container that holds information, okay? And the information that the block or the ledger holds is a list of transactions that have happened in the last 10 minutes, okay? So every single 10 minutes, these miners are verifying transactions and they take the transactions from the last 10 minutes and they arrange them into a verified block. Okay, and the block is then linked to the next 10 minute transactions list through what's called a hash. A hash is when you take an input, usually like a symbol or a numerical input, and you run it through a function and it outputs. My understanding is that the output then is a new output, a new output number that can't be traced back. So it only goes in one direction. And this essentially makes the ledger permanent. So it's kind of like marking it in stone. Very computationally difficult to go back and change anything in the past. And so this keeps happening every 10 minutes, 10, 20, 30, everywhere, all over the world, are different nodes, different computers forming these miners all over the world. Here's actually a map of all the Bitcoin miners throughout the world. So the biggest places are US and China. And so here's where everybody, all the different nodes, the votes are 
mining the Bitcoin system. So all the ledgers that get assembled in the single blockchain is maintained by computer systems that are dispersed all over the planet. So the idea is that the fourth, I should have added this, the fourth innovation of Bitcoin is that it disperses the control of the money system. So it's not just a single federal entity controlling the money system. It's a dispersed voting block of essentially what are Bitcoin miners that have agreed to the coded system, which is sort of the contract. So these are all the people in the world who agree with the Bitcoin contract, which is the code that can never be changed because all the systems are verifying each other simultaneously. And the reason that this is called the blockchain is it just essentially forms a chain into the future of transactions of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin adds a lot of security to the money system because as this chain keeps going forward and forward and forward, it becomes very difficult to steal or break the Bitcoin because all this information is recorded on the ledgers that are permanent. And were anybody ever to make an attempt to go back in time and change something to change the contract of Bitcoin or to change the numbers in the Bitcoin system, it would create what would be a fork. And the reason that that could never work is because the chain that keeps going, okay, the miners that are continuing to push this chain forward and forward into the future will not vote that this is a valid transaction, okay? And so as this chain keeps going and going and going, these miners stick with this chain. And so this makes it impossible to go back into the system back in time and change things in the ledger in the past, which is essentially a resistance against fraud. So in the Bitcoin literature, this in the in the actual pseudo or the pseudocode and the algorithms, this is the preference for the longest hash or the longest chain. Essentially, when the miners vote, they'll vote algorithmically on the longest chain, which has been the consensus, which makes it impossible to sort of change the timeline, change what's been agreed upon. So the fifth thing is it's resistant to fraud and hack. Okay, so the third invention, that it adds encryption. So right now, everything that goes to the bank is tracked. And I understand why the federal system probably does that. But there's a lot of people who don't agree that that should be the policy. There's a lot of people who think that you should be able to spend your money freely from person to person. And so crypto is an attempt to add encryption into the monetary system. So what encryption will do is the accounts are encrypted so they're not connected to a person. You can hold what's called a wallet and all the information in the wallet is encrypted. And when these transactions go through, there's a process of encryption so that nobody's identities are known. So you could see this as two ways. In one sense, you're protecting yourself because all your data and all your information is encrypted and people can't come and find you as a target. So if you're thinking about like identity fraud or in terms of their, if it's probably harder to hack into somebody's crypto wallet and steal their crypto because of this ledger blockchain system than it would be to hack into a banking system and change the numbers in the banking system. So in one sense, the encryption protects you as the user. And I think that's the way that most of the coders probably see it. It's not necessarily an outright attempt to sort of like circumvent the law in being able to exchange money. It's more of a protection system. That's how my understanding of the, they probably would have seen it as the coders. So that's what Bitcoin is. Now, I'll probably do, like, I'm trying to actually understand the code. I'm trying to, First, what I'm doing is I'm trying to understand pseudocode, all the little things and the voting systems and the miners and the objects that get encoded. So I'll probably continue to try to study the code and try to release some versions of the code or re release some discussions on the code because I really like to understand it. Like algorithmically, it's very interesting. And this guy who invented this, who solved this peer-to-peer -peer problem, like this is actually an academic who's solving a, an academic problem. And you can tell when you read the paper that this person is highly educated, extremely good at cryptography, coding, and sort of systems thinking. 
like when you when you learn like what that Bitcoin code is actually doing, there's some fascinating things that were programmed into the system to build a better financial system. I'll, I'll try to make more videos about that as I go into the future. So the one thing I, I, I could talk about now is, so if I, if I think about like, why was Bitcoin invented? So Bitcoin was invented probably by somebody in my generation, maybe a little bit more senior, maybe a little bit older. So I bet the inventor of Bitcoin is somewhere between 30 to 40. And I'm starting to develop some hypotheses for who I think this person is. So I'll probably try to do some videos on that, thinking that through too. My hypothesis is that the Bitcoin invention, this paper is an academic paper. And so my hypothesis is that the person who invented it probably had an academic track record and learned how to write academic papers. So that this is there's no way that this is their first paper. So somebody in this Bitcoin invention process has written academic papers on the subject. And so I bet if you trace back the literature, which I'm starting to do, I guarantee you one of those people is one of these Bitcoin founders. And so I think they're probably they're probably about 30 to 40 years old. They have an academic track record. And it's somebody who's interested in inventing things with software. This is an inventor. And so inventors would not stop. They would keep inventing stuff. So I would invent that this, this inventor has probably invented more things since then. So they're probably somebody that we can find out who it is. Why was Bitcoin invented? So I just saw a graph on investment strategy on the X platform. And what you see is you see the value of the dollar. The value of the dollar has gone down and down and down. And the essentially the value curve looks like this. The value curve of gold looks like this. The value curve of stocks and investments looks like this. And so you get a sense that Bitcoin was invented because the people who are in charge are inflating the money so much and the system, or, or perhaps maybe just the, the banking system is so inefficient that it causes errors that are perhaps inflating our money. And it's getting so bad that if you try to save, you're a sucker to save because every year the value of the dollar is decreasing. And if you look at the value curve of Bitcoin, the person who invented Bitcoin wanted to fix this problem and invent a digital currency whose value would go like this. I don't know what's gonna be up here. This is many, many years into the future. Maybe Bitcoin's value would look like this. Maybe Bitcoin's value would look like this. But the person who invented Bitcoin built into the system that the value has to increase. So if people are if people are investing in this Bitcoin idea, and what creates a new money is just people buying into the system, people thinking that this is something that I'm willing to barter with. So something that is, for example, a dollar or something that is a piece of gold, that is a concept that we bought into that there's value in that. And so the Bitcoin is the idea that what we've bought into is the value of computation. So essentially the value of computer chips and being able to do what's called compute mathematical problems on computers, the value of Bitcoin is linked to the power of compute. That's what's backing it. And so it's proposed as being an online digital currency because people who make their livings online, and there's many people who do that nowadays, whether through their influence or through their social media or through a website or through a product that they sell or a service they provide or code that they write, what they value is the value of computation. And so if everybody buys into the system who works online, they can create a system where they can exchange online payments in a more free society. And the reason that the value of Bitcoin will only go up is because there is a max set into the code that there will only be it's either 21 million or 21 billion. So the max Bitcoin, Bitcoin that will ever be created is 21 million. And so at some point, and, and we're actually very close to mining all the Bitcoin. So if you look at the curve of how much Bitcoin is left to be mined, I could do a whole video on mining later, like what it is. It's essentially the miners get paid or rewarded when they service the ledger. That's what the mining is paying for. And so the mining of Bitcoin, the miners are paid in Bitcoin and the curve looks like this of mining Bitcoin. 
it gets harder and harder to computationally mine Bitcoin because the blockchain becomes longer and longer and longer. So servicing the ledger keeps taking more and more time. And right now we are something like right here where we've nine mined essentially most of the Bitcoin. And so the Bitcoin is going to essentially get more and more scarce. And the maximum produce will always only be set to 21 million. So this is the a very rare resource. It's a scarce thing. And what it's holding is value. It's holding a voucher that says this person carries this much computational value. And so the hypothesis, here's the hypothesis, is that as the Bitcoin becomes more and more scarce, the value of Bitcoin should exponentially increase. And so this was built into the coding framework of Bitcoin. This person who invented this, they understood this. And this was this was a programmed attempt to do this, to build a usable system that would increase in value, a usable asset that would increase in value that would be unhackable, that would be transferable and usable, and that could protect you against the destruction of the American dollar. So this is my first attempt to make a Bitcoin video. Again, this is something I'm just starting to research. And so don't take everything I've said here as correct. I'm giving you my best read on it, and I'm starting to read the literature on it. So I'll probably try to do more videos explaining it. And I'm going to try to whittle down to the best explanation, because I think the biggest problem for Bitcoin is people don't understand it. They didn't even understand the problem that it's solving. They weren't even essentially aware. And so the most difficulty that Bitcoin has in establishing itself is just explaining what it's dealing with, why it's an innovation and why it's a solution. So I'm going to work, work towards preparing that best explanation from actually the perspective of attempting to understand the code. It's also just really algorithmically interesting. Okay, have a nice day. Happy Thanksgiving. May your abundance and bounty be great and vast. And may your investments prosper.